hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, community conversation on internet computer security best practices um, this is with rule storms and myself robin uh, from definitive product security team um, so in our team we're responsible to do security reviews for the code that is developed at definity and we also develop uh, tooling around security yeah so let's dive in into uh, security uh, best practices so um, we have a, a website like in the in the docs part of uh, uh, of uh, of our documentation uh, on internetcomputer.org the link is here and this is a collection of many security best practices that uh, we would like to advertise to to the community we also use this internally um, this is just a screenshot of this so um these security best practices, these are inspired by actual security bugs that we have found in our reviews and also in external security reviews. And we have some of these bugs, we have seen them many times. And uh, so we would like to share this to raise awareness for such security issues and to, to give good advice on, and recommendations on how to prevent them. Um, also, um, uh, this intent, so we intend. Uh, to, to give this advice so that uh, people can address issues early in the development life cycle, um, even before they might do a security review uh, in the end, maybe before they go live. Um, but at the same time, I, I want to mention this is not um, really replacing security audits, right? So if you develop a, a really security critical application, for example, in the DeFi area, we still recommend that you have your, uh, your code or your project reviewed by, by third party security auditors. Yeah. So we also created a, a forum post, uh, which is a platform for discussion. So if you have any questions or feedback on security pra best practices or on this talk, please go there. We're happy to, uh, to discuss with you there also. Right, so um, let's dive in. So this is the outline for our talk. So we have two parts. First, we will talk about inter-canister calls and state changes. This uh, is the part where I will be talking. This will be about 20 minutes. And then in the second part, we will talk about uh, storing confidential information on canisters. Um, and this is uh, the part where we will uh, we'll take over. Uh, finally, we'll, ha we'll have a session uh, for answering questions. So you can put questions in the chat and we will pick them up in the end and, and discuss them. Yep. So. Uh, I guess let's dive into the first part on uh, inter-canister calls and uh, state changes. Good, so what is the motivation behind this? So one nice motivation are double spending issues that can arise in this context. So let's look at what double spending issues could be here. So let's say we have this ledger canister here and uh, now we have some attacker that wants to withdraw funds from the ledger canister. But it actually thinks, OK, can I withdraw maybe twice and only reduce my balance once, right? So I get kind of double the money and I, I, I only uh, reduce my balance once. So that would be kind of a typical double spending uh, issue. And this is the kind of issue that could arise also in the context of intracanister calls and, and the messaging mechanism on the internet computer. So we will discuss such double spending issues here. Um, and we will also discuss how one could avoid uh, this kind of problem. OK, so uh, in order to, uh, to understand the issues, we first need to um, understand some basics about the messaging model of the internet computer. So like I want to introduce some message execution basics. Now, first, I mean, what is a message, right? So a message is just a set of consecutive uh, instructions that uh, the internet computer will uh, will process at once. So, so this we, we call a message. It will become more clear in, in the subsequent slides. Um, and so one property of, this, of, of the messages that the internet computer processes is that only a single message is processed at a given time. So it looks like this, right? We have the timeline here, and now we have consecutive messages um, indicated by these uh, circles here. Uh, that are executed one after each other. And the important thing is that there are never two messages executed concurrently or in parallel. It's always one after, after the other. 
Right. So a second fact about this, this message, message execution. So whenever you make a call to a canister, like a query or an update call, this will trigger a message on the internet computer. So, and also when an intro canister call is made, the code after the call is actually executed as a separate message. So let's look at this uh, with a bit more concretely with, with this example here. So here we see a, a, a function in Motoko, uh, which I call example. And uh, we would just say, okay, this is a call, right? So in this case, it would be an update call. It could also be a query call. Um, so now naively we would think, okay, maybe a message is just, you know, processing the entire call that we see here. But this is actually not the case once intercanister calls come into play. So that's what we see on line three here, um, where this method has this await and then this method some inter uh, canister call. So here the, the canister will issue a call to another canister and wait for the response. So that's an asynchronous call. And this will actually trigger uh, like ending the current message. And then only when the call the call returns, it will trigger a second message. To depict this, right? So the first message is here. So the code until the intercanister call is made. And then we have another message, which is the callback. So when the intercanister call returns, then the, this callback message will be involved and executed. And if we just have a, a single call here to this example method, um, so again, depicting these individual messages with my circles here, one and two. And so what would happen here, right? We have these two messages. We have the first message, like the first part uh, of, of this call executed first. And then we have the second message, which, which will be executed in the call then. And here, the ordering of these messages is really this way, right? So it's first the first part and the callback only later because the second message is triggered by the first one. Um, yeah, so, but in general, I mean, there are many messages on the IC, right? And there could be, for example, other messages being executed in between these two messages. And this can also lead to some subtle issues as we will see a bit later. Um, and yeah, so let's look more about uh, at interleaving calls, right? So messages from interleaving calls actually have no reliable execution order. So let's look at this also in an example. So I just took exactly the same code from the previous slide here and we see the boxes that uh, that show the, the individual message again. And let's now call this example method just twice in parallel, right? So I as a caller would just call it twice at the same time. So what, what can now happen in terms of ordering of messages, right? So if we look at the first call, maybe this arrives first, right? And this would produce this first message um, here, which I, I depict for call one. And then maybe it would, uh, you know, call into this uh, intercanister call and the, the, this would return and the callback would then be executed. Right? And then maybe after this, the second call would be scheduled, right? And uh, so we have the first part of the second call and then the callback for the second call. So that's one possible scheduling of the messages here, right? But it could also look differently. So another option would be this. So we first uh, have the first message for the first call, but then we process the first message for the second call. And only then we would uh, process the callback for the first call and finally the callback for the second call. And so, so what this slide says, right, is there is no reliable ordering on this. So, so you cannot assume that th there is a specific ordering happening. So, so yeah, exactly. So that's uh, about the interleaving calls. Now, um, another fact about this message execution is the following. Um, when there is a trap or a panic or like an exception, as you would call it in other languages maybe, um, modifications to the state for the current message are not applied. So if you, for example, see here, let's say in this first message, this some code part would produce such a trap or exception. What would happen is any changes to the canister code that were done in this some code part before that message, uh, before, before the trap happens, would actually not be applied. So all these ca canister changes in the state they're not about right. 
Um, so this can happen, for example, in that message. It could also happen in the second message, right? In this code that is executed there. If the trap happens, no changes to the canister state done while processing this message would be applied. We will see very concrete examples a bit later, but this is also a very important fact. Okay, now um, I would like to introduce an example that I will use for the for the rest of my part of the talk. Um, so, and this example is a canister holding ICP for users. So we have this example canister and we have the ICP ledger. And on the ICP ledger, this example canister has an account and it holds some number of ICPs, right? As we see here. Now, the canister itself actually holds this ICP on behalf of some users. So internally, it uses like a, you know a table or let's say a hash map, um, where we just say, okay, Rule is very rich. He has like a 40k uh, ICP. Then we have Gregory who has a thousand ICP, and myself with with a humble uh, 7.5 ICP. So so the canister kind of keeps track, you know, of how this its its own ledger balance is distributed to the users, right? <laughs> so now let's look. So it's a natural thing that maybe users at some point want to take out their funds, right? And so I will call that refunding. And so what I would like to do, for example, at some point in time, I decide, okay, I want my 7.5 ICP back that this canister is holding for me. And I will call a refund function to this example canister, and it will give me those ICP back. And this is the example that we will look at, right? Let me introduce this in terms of a Motoko method. So this can look like this. So let's let's go through this uh, code together. So first, this Motoko uh, exposes the caller here. So this is just a variable that identifies the principle that is calling the method, so, right? So if I, as Robin, will call refund, the caller will just be Robin, my principle. Right? So that's, uh, that comes from the IC system API. Now, in the first step here, we will read the caller's balance. So this will just be, you know, we go into this local balances table uh, for Robin, right? And we will see, okay, it has uh, Robin has 7.5 ICP, and this will then give us the, the Robin's balance, right? Which is the caller's balance. And then in the next step, we issue an inter-canister call to the lecturer to send those 7.5 ICP back to Robin. So this is this uh, transfer ICP to the caller and with this balance, right? So this is uh, 7.5 ICP. Okay, so that's the inter-canister call. And now if the ledger returns an okay result, so the transfer was successful, we will reset the balance to zero. Okay. Uh, yeah, so meaning yeah, if, if I do another refund after that, I, I would not get any anything more out essentially. So yeah, so that's uh, our our example that we will use uh, throughout the rest here. Okay, so let's uh, go back to our messaging model and use our boxes again to depict uh, how these messages look in this case, right? So the first message here is until we issue the intercanister call. Um, and the second message is the callback where we return from the intercanister call that did the transfer, and then we will reset our balances to zero. So that's the that's the how the messaging look. And recall, so for for an individual call, we have this ordering right that first we do the first part of the call and only then the callback will be executed. Okay, so that's uh, for the messaging model. Okay, so now um, we have introduced our messaging basics and we have seen this example. And now I can show you concrete security bugs in this example. And the first one is related to this best practice that we have avoid panics after a wait. And so let me show you what, what can uh, go bad with panics or traps. Okay, so again, we have the example exactly as we had it before. Um, and so we go through it again, right? So we read the caller's balance on, on this first line here, and then we do the inter-canister call with the await, right? So this will send the, the, the funds, and then, um, if the result is okay, we set the balance to zero. Now, I added another method here, which is called update statistics after refund. Now, um, this method is just something new I added in my, in my code, right? 
which uh, which updates which takes some statistics about this refund right it, it stores some statistics in the data structure in the canister it's not important in what what exactly it doesn't need to but let's assume that there is a bug here where this data structure after doing some refunds becomes full and at that point this method would always trap right because it cannot store anything anymore so and it would just trap right so that means we now have a situation after you know some refunds might have been successful but now we have a situation where we always trap at this point now let's uh, think about what this means right we've learned that when you trap all the state changes for that message will not be applied in particular this means that this local balances dot put zero so resetting the balance to zero this change will not be applied right so now we are in a situation where we did a transfer in our first message right so we issued the transfer but we are not resetting the balance to zero so this means in that situation you can call refund many times and each time you will read the current balance which will never be set to zero and in each time a, a ledger transfer will be issued so, so you can kind of refund your money very many times and essentially stealing from other users, right? So that's our first security bug. Due to the trap that we see here, the local balances are never reduced and an attacker can refund the balance multiple times, essentially draining the funds that other users have put on this canister. Yeah, and uh, so what do you do to avoid these situations, right? You really have to, uh, work hard to avoid traps or panics after you uh, you do inter canister calls with these awaits. Right? So that's the recommendation for this. Yeah. So this is already a first example of like a, a double spending type of of uh, of bug, and uh, we can. I, I have another example I would like to show you, um, which is about message ordering. Uh, yeah. So let's recall again uh, our messaging model right so we have our first message and our second message it's still the same example for paying refunds so this is uh, this we know already so and recall that there is no guarantee no reliable message ordering for for executing the messages as we have seen in the beginning as well good so now we have an attacker here and it thinks, okay, maybe let's just call refund twice in parallel. So let's see what could happen in that scenario. Right? So we have our two messages here for an individual call. And let's look at some possible ordering of messages in this context, right? So first we have maybe, it could be that the first call that this attacker issues, uh, the, this, the first message in this is executed, right? The, the orange part. And then it could be that immediately, you know, the callback is, is very fast and it returns and we will execute the, the message from the callback right away. Right. So note that what did it do, right? The, the message one, it issued the transfer for the ICP and message two now sets the balance to zero. So that's really nice, right? Now we're in a situation where the balance is zero. And now maybe the second call is scheduled, right? And it will also it will read the balance again and it will actually see a zero balance and this will lead to a zero transfer which is fine so in some sense everything works as intended here right so uh, on message three local balances is already zero because the callback for the first call has done that and no refund is issued in call two which is really nice right there is no double spending issue this ordering of messages is all fine right but uh, maybe let's look at the more interesting ordering of messages here. So it could also be that, again, we schedule the first message for call one. Uh, and note, so when, when this uh, is executed, it will issue a transfer, right? So going back to uh, my own funds, like it will send uh, 7.5 ICP to me, right? And now, but let's assume that the as the next message is the first message for call two. So now again, we will check the caller balance. Now this is still 7.5 ICP for Robin, and it will also issue the transfer, right? So at this point, we're issuing the transfer for a second time. So this is a double spending block again. So now the, the transfer has been issued twice, 
And then maybe next we have the callback for the first call, right? Which will set the balance to zero. And then we have the callback for the second call, and it will also set the balance to zero, right? So that's, uh, that's what happens here. And we have another security bug. So when message two is executed, the balance is not yet set to zero because no callback has been executed yet. And thus the refund is issued again. Yeah. So that's again, a double spending bug. And an attacker could actually, is not limited to sending this refund call just twice, right? It can just send it many times and hope that, you know, you, you often get into this situation and, and you get your refund uh, uh, many times. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's this uh, second bug about the message ordering. Now, the interesting question is, how do you address an issue like this, right? And the answer is you can use locking mechanisms to avoid this, this situation. Now, in our example, we can make sure that there is at most one refund happening per caller. And uh, so I, I want to show this pattern here just as kind of a pseudocode. So we have our, our call, right? So <laughs> what we do here on line two, first is we would check if the caller is locked for refunding, right? And we would immediately return if the caller is locked. And we could return an error from that call in that, in that case. Now, second thing, right? If the caller has not been locked so far, um, we would lock the caller. And then we would actually, so then we have line four, right? We, we modify our state. We make some inter canister calls in this locked state. And then before we return, we release the lock again for the caller, right? And then in the end, we, we return our results and, and are done with the call. So this pattern fixes the issue because now it's only possible to, to like execute a single refund for a caller at a given time. Then this, this fixes the issue. Now, this is just pseudocode, right? So let's look at how this looks concretely in Motoko. So how would you implement this in Motoko? So this is the code and uh, let's walk through it together. So, First, we have this checking the lock part, right? So we will use a, a set in Motoko, so which is which I call ongoing transactions, uh, to lock the callers that have a refund in progress. So being in this set, if a caller is in this set, it means the caller is locked. So and here we check if um, if the caller is locked, right? We immediately return with an error a uh, transaction already in progress on line three. Okay. And then, so if that was not the case, then um, we will actually lock that caller by putting him into this set, right? So we have ongoing transactions put caller on line five. And now we just execute our refunding method that we already know, right? So this is just reading the caller balance, doing the transfer and resetting the balance to zero after that. <coughs> and finally, we will unlock the caller. So we will just remove the caller again from, from our set uh, of ongoing transactions. And with this, we, we guarantee that there can only be a single ongoing refund for, for a caller. And this solves the, the issue that we have seen before. Yeah, so uh, that was a, a bit technical. I hope, uh, I hope you could uh, follow the example. Um, let me summarize this with a few recommendations. So, so what should you do when you develop canisters, right? Um, when you have, when you're dealing with inter-canister calls, so you have these awaits uh, for asynchronous inter-canister calls, you should review these really carefully. So if two messages access the same state, like, you know, reading or writing it, ask yourself, is it possible to find a scheduling of these messages that leads to an illegal transaction or some inconsistent state. And if this is the case, employ a locking mechanism similar to what I outlined for in our example to, to address this. Now, a small remark for Rust developers, um, you can use Rust's drop implementations to release the lock, which gives you the nice property that um, you would actually even release the lock if there would be a trap in the callback. So I will not go into, into details about this, uh, but uh, this is actually a nice pattern that you can use in Rust. 
yeah, so this uh, summarizes the recommendations. Uh, and it also concludes uh, the first part uh, of the community conversation. So um, I would like to hand over to Rule, which will, who will go into the second part about storing confidential information. Thank you very much, Robert. I hope my screen is visible to everyone. Good. Um, so yeah, the second part is about storing confidential information on the internet computer. Uh, some of you might be aware of this. Uh, for some of this, uh, so, sorry, for some of you, this might be new information. So uh, let's have a look at a very high level uh, what the internet computer is and how we interact with it. So on the left side, we have a user. He's using a browser and he wants to access some data on the internet computer. So he would first send a request, which would be received by a boundary node. Uh, which is boundary between the internet and the internet computer. Now, on that boundary node, to be able to do its job, that HTTPS connection needs to be terminated. So the traffic needs to be decrypted, and uh, your message that you're sending is actually visible uh, to the boundary node virtual machine. So that also means that the boundary node operator, uh, in theory, has access to your information. That means if you want to send confidential information, this might be a bit of an issue for your application. Then in the second step, the boundary node forwards your message towards the right uh, subnet on which the DAP is running. That subnet consists of physical servers. And on these physical servers, we run replica software, which actually executes your message. To be able to do this, of course, your message also needs to be uh, available on this machine in, in a plain text format. So uh, people who have access to the system, like the data center operators, could have a look at the contents of your message. The fact that confidentiality is not a guarantee should not really be a surprise uh, to people in the blockchain space. I mean, that most blockchains have this property. We're really good at availability and at integrity of data, but confidentiality is not really one of our strong points. So in case you plan to store confidential information, or you already do this, um, just think about this design and follow the rest of the, of the recommendations that we will be giving here. If, you, if there's anything that you need to remember from the second part of this talk, it's that storing confidential information has its risks. And if you want to do it, think carefully on how to do it properly. OK, so if you want to use the internet computer for confidential information, what could you do? You could apply end-to-end -end encryption, which means in its very basic form that you would encrypt the message at the very beginning and you would decrypt it at the very end and everything in the middle, such as the internet computer, but any part of the network, any component would not be able to see the information that you're uh, communicating or that you're storing because it's always an encrypted form. So as I've shown here on the slides, the sender on the left, he would generate a message, he would encrypt it, send the encrypted message to the internet computer to be stored in a, in a DAP. Then at a later point in time, someone else, or, or even that same person for that matter, could retrieve that message and decrypt it again. So this is very high level what we want to achieve if we want to um, work with confidential information. A very important side note here is, of course, that if we're working with encrypted information, then the internet computer can only see the ciphertext and it's hard to do any meaningful process. Every time we talk about encryption and cryptography, well, then we need to question where are the keys? But before we dive into that problem, let's first take a step back and um, have a look at cryptography 101. The, just the basic stuff you need to know to understand the rest of the talk. This won't take too long. Um, simply put, you can you have um, symmetric encryption, and symmetric encryption has existed for centuries. It's very simple to understand, and it also has its applications with its limitations. So, what does it look like? If you have some plain text information, a message that you want to keep confidential, you would encrypt it with a symmetric encryption key and an encryption algorithm that would result in the middle of, of the slide in some cipher text. And then when you want to see that information again, you would decrypt it with the same key to get the plain text information. Okay, knowing symmetric encryption, could we solve our end-to-end -end, uh, encryption problem 
if we have a sender and a receiver and the sender wants to get a certain confidential message to the receiver over an untrusted channel. This untrusted channel has the property of guaranteeing integrity and authenticity of the communication, but not the confidentiality. So this is exactly as with the internet computer, very good at integrity and authenticity, uh, not so great at confidentiality on all levels. How can you do it with symmetric encryption? Well, maybe the receiver could just give you an encryption key. The sender could take that key, encrypt his message, send the encrypted message to the receiver, and then the receiver could simply decrypt the message. Seems to work fine until, of course, we introduce our attacker. The attacker in step one could steal the key because he has uh, some form of access to this channel. He could then in step three steal the message and he could apply the same algorithm to decrypt the message. So confidentiality of your message has been lost. Clearly, this doesn't work. So luckily, some smart people came up with an other form of encryption called asymmetric encryption. And the key here is that we actually have two keys. So we have a key pair consisting of a public key and a private key. The public key, as the name says, is public. You can share it with whoever you like. It doesn't really compromise security of a system. Um, the private key, you need to keep private and not disclose to any. So in this uh, asymmetric encryption, you would encrypt the plain text information with the public key. You would give your encrypted message uh, to someone else who has the private key, and that person can decrypt it to obtain the, the original message. Cool, nice properties of this uh, asymmetric encryption. Let's see how that works in our problem. We again have the same sender and the same receiver. In step one, the receiver would now generate such a key pair. He would generate a public key and a private key, and he would send that public key over our untrusted channel towards the sender. The sender would use that public key to encrypt the message. He would send that encrypted message back, and the receiver can use the private key that he kept secure. He can use that key to decrypt the message. If we introduce our attacker in the system here, he can steal the key, he can steal the message, but the only key that he can see is actually the public key. So with the public key and the message, he can't do anything. It's the wrong key. Uh, he can't decrypt the message. So there's probably some merit in using this asymmetric encryption uh, for our purposes as well. Okay, now that we got this crypto stuff covered, let's look at uh, an example use case that we wanna, uh, that we wanna solve. And I want to especially thank uh, Tima Henke, who actually uh, started this uh, very early on, uh, considering this confidentiality issue and created an example that uh, called the IC Vault. I also like to thank the, the team at Affinity who built upon that to make the encrypted notes that, because this is actually the basis for the rest of this presentation. And I mean, they did, they did a, good, a very good job, uh, and I'll try to explain uh, how it works. So the use case in its simplest form is a system to store note notes, just text that you want to keep for yourself. Those notes, you would send them towards the IC to store them in a canister, and at a later point in time, you would want to retrieve those notes. But of course, the notes, they could contain confidential information. So if you do it like this, then someone on the IC could have a look at your information, uh, and that would be a problem. Um, Okay, let's let's have a look at how we could design a secure solution for this very simple use case. On the IC, we could develop a canister. That canister could keep track of users and of nodes, and the nodes they would they have their contents encrypted. In the browser, we could keep a symmetric encryption key that we would use to encrypt the nodes and then store them on the IC. And later, when we retrieve them, we use that same encryption key to decrypt the contents. So this is fairly simple and actually at first sight seems to work pretty well. Let's make our use case slightly more complex because in the real world, our user has multiple devices. So he has maybe a browser running on a laptop and he has another browser running on a smartphone. Well, in the first step, he would create a note using his laptop and he would store that note on the IC. Then later he would retrieve that note uh, using a second browser. But if both browsers have generated their own symmetric encryption key, then these would be different keys and the second browser would not have the right key to decrypt the note. So this wouldn't work. 
of course, browser, browser one could decrypt its nodes, um, but that really doesn't help in our scenario. So how can we solve the multiple uh, device issue that we have here? This is the same problem, but then looking at it from a data model. So we would have two browsers, each with their symmetric key. We conclude that that doesn't really work. So what if we just move that symmetric key into the IC and we give every user uh, one symmetric key? This could work, right? I mean, every browser could just fetch the symmetric key, fetch the encrypted node, and decrypt it. But of course, if we store the symmetric key also on the IC, then we can guarantee confidentiality. Someone can steal the symmetric key, can steal the notes, and just decrypt the notes. So this really doesn't help us. So if we cannot store the symmetric key, then maybe we can store something else that would allow us to obtain the symmetric key at a later point in time. So we already know we want to encrypt this content with the symmetric key, but the symmetric key is not there. We will actually store the symmetric key once per device, and we will encrypt that symmetric key. With what will we encrypt it? Well, we will encrypt it with a public key, and that public key has a private key that is still in the browser. So we generate a public-private key pair. The public key we store on the IC. It's public information. We don't really need to care much. And the private key we keep private in the browser. Now, if we have this private key in the browser, that means that we can now also obtain the symmetric key because we can decrypt it. And if we obtain the symmetric key, then we can actually decrypt the contents of the nodes and get their plain text. So this seems to make sense. Let's have a look at our second device. The second device would also need this symmetric key, and it would also need to be encrypted to avoid leaking it to people on the IC. And we would then encrypt it with the public key of the second device. The second device would also have a private key in the browser. So that's our end goal. That's what we want to achieve. Um, but how do we reach this point? How do we generate all these keys and give everyone the right version of the right key? That's uh, why in the next step, we'll go to device onboarding. And device onboarding happens in two steps or in two phases. In step one, we will have our uh, user using his browser. And well, at, at first, we want that user to authenticate himself. We want to know who, who are you, because we're going to give you some storage where you can uh, store your notes. But we're going to only make those notes accessible to you, so we need to know who you are. Luckily, the internet computer has a very good identity provider called the Internet Identity. We're not going to explain it here in, in much detail uh, because it's, it's also comes with its own uh, security considerations. But just know that we have an identity provider and we can ask the user to authenticate this. Once that's been done, the um, Internet Identity will return your principal and your principal ID, and then your browser will generate a key pair. A key pair consisting of a private key and a public key. The private key we keep securely locked away in the browser, and the public key will, we will actually send towards notes canister together with our uh, device and a device alias and our principal ID. Of course, all of this information is actually signed by your internet identity, uh, and this will be the case for a lot of information that we need to transmit to the canister um, because we don't want anyone else sending information in our name. We only want the correct user to be able to register a device with a correct public. All right, once we've done onboarding step one, what have we created? So we created uh, our private key in the browser. We created a, a device that has a name, an alias, a public key, and we created our first user. What we haven't created yet is the symmetry key. Um, and we haven't stored it yet on the IC. So in the onboarding step two, we will do just that. This is very simple. We assume we're still authenticated and on the same browser, on the same device, we will now generate a symmetric key. We will encrypt that symmetric key with the public key that we generated in step one, and then we will store all the information on the IC. So again, we send the encrypted symmetric key, the name of our device, the principal ID, and everything gets stored. Note that the symmetric key is only sent to the IC in an encrypted form, and the only uh, entity that's able to get the symmetric key back is this browser because it has the correct private key. So we created this orange encrypted symmetric key. Actually, our first device seems to be uh, 
onboarded pretty well. We have all the, um, the keys in place to start storing nodes. So now let's uh, store a node. What does that look like? Um, well, of course, the first step is to create a node, type in some text. And then the second step is to get the symmetric key to encrypt this node. So you would request the canister for the device encrypted symmetric key. So this is the encrypted symmetric key encrypted for this single device. We obtain the symmetric key and we decrypt it with our browser's private key, or better yet, the private key that we stored away in the browser. By decrypting it, we obtain the symmetric key, and this is the symmetric key that we then will use to encrypt the nodes, uh, which happens in step five. We take our node, we encrypt it with the symmetric key, and then uh, we only have the ciphertext, which we can store on the canister, and that happens in step six. So what have we done in our data model? Let's have a look. We're at the bottom right, we actually created a node. We create encrypted the content, uh, so it seems fine. Let's reiterate over how this all works. So we encrypted the content with the symmetric key. We encrypted the symmetric key with the public key of that device. And the public key belongs to the private key, which is neatly stuck, uh, tucked away in the browser. This private key will allow us to decrypt the symmetric key. And that symmetric key we can then use to decrypt the node content. All right, seems all fine up till now. Let's try and retrieving such an encrypted node from the IC. Um, this is pretty simple. Let's assume we have already authenticated ourselves. If not, then this is just the same steps that we've seen earlier. We authenticate with the internet identity, but we still have a session, um, so we don't need to re-authenticate. So we request the notes canister for our notes. The notes canister will return those notes in encrypted form, and it will also conveniently provide us with our encrypted symmetry. This key we will then decrypt with the private key that we find in the browser, and then we can use the symmetry key to decrypt those and obtain the original plain text message. So yeah, it seems to work pretty nice, but I think we've forgotten something, right? We actually talked about having multiple devices for a user. And so far, we don't have a second device uh, that's able to access our nodes. So how do we set that second device properly? If we look at our data model, all these orange blocks, we need to establish them now. And this is how we do the second. This is what we will do in the second device. Report. So first of all, we will uh, authenticate our second device. No? So now we have our smartphone. Uh, the laptop is already fully onboarded. Now we take our new smartphone, we go towards the internet identity, we authenticate. We have to use the same principle as we've used earlier, because else we would just be setting up a new user, but we want to have the same user with a new device. So we authenticate, we get our principal and our principal ID back, and we generate the key pair. This is the exact same as for the first onboarding. Um, nothing strange happening here. We will then register this device with the public key and the principal in the nodes cast. So let's look at the data model. We have set up a new browser, a browser storage. We have a private key that's stored over there. We also have uh, an object to keep track of our second device with a name uh, and a public key. But we're still missing the encrypted symmetry. And this is, uh, I think, where the design gets, gets pretty clever. Um, how do we get obtain the symmetric key for the second device? Well, we will actually ask the first browser to provide this for us. So we go back to our first device, being our laptop, I think it was, right? So we will go onto our laptop, we will authenticate, um, get our principal, and then we will ask the canister for all the new devices, all of the devices which are currently in the middle of boarding, which do not have their version of the symmetric key yet. The canister will give us a list of all the public keys of these devices and our own encrypted symmetric key. We will use our own private key to decrypt that symmetric key. And then we will, for each public key that we have found uh, in this list of public keys, we will re-encrypt the symmetric key with that public key. 
Finally, in step seven, we will just uh, give uh, back all these encrypted symmetric keys once for every public key that was provided by us. So, so in this situation, what this actually means is we now are sending back encrypted symmetric keys, and those are encrypted with the public key of our smartphone, of our new device. This effectively establishes this orange encrypted symmetric key. And now you can see device one and device two have exactly the same information. So device two is perfectly capable of decrypting the encrypted notes because it has its own symmetry. Um, as I said, so all of this is based on the encrypted notes example DAP. There is source code for this uh, DAP. They have implemented this. This is, of course, still an example application. So there are some remaining security considerations and some disclaimers that you should carefully read before reusing any of this code. But um, this code has been uh, carefully looked at and uh, it, it's pretty robust uh, as it is. So it's, it's definitely good to get some inspiration from. There's also uh, the second link at the bottom, which is further documentation on this encrypted notes that. So what can you do as a developer of, of DAPs? Well, first question you need to ask yourself, of course, is are you storing confidential information? And if so, um, am I aware of it? Am, am I uh, doing this securely? Because maybe you want to have a look at the slide deck again and at the example DAP to see if you can reuse some of this design. But probably, depending on your use case, you will have to adapt this. There's also many points that we didn't cover today, such as what if a user clears his browser storage and loses his private key? What if he does that for all his browsers and all the private keys have been lost? And in theory, he could lose access to his notes. Maybe you want to build a recovery mechanism somehow. What if users would like to share notes between, between them or between uh, multiple users? then you would want to set up maybe some sort of security context where you have one shared symmetric key for all these users. So clearly, uh, if your use case becomes more complex, the design becomes more complex, but this can be used uh, as, a, as a basis. Let's say a user loses the private key, then yeah, we, we also need to think about key revocation. Um, on the IC, you know we have update versus query calls, which uh, is important because query calls don't guarantee uh, integrity, which, which is important in some parts of this design, and you will find more information on this. Um, and if you're also interested in storing confidential information, certainly look out for uh, threshold key derivation. We have Greg here today, who can maybe introduce the subject briefly. Uh, I don't know if you can take over audio, Greg. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Hoop. Yeah, so this is um, just a teaser for a new feature that we currently have a forum post. Join the discussion if you want to chime in. So this would be an alternative way of uh, doing confidential information in canisters and other things. Um, in case you know identity-based encryption, it's a sort of encryption where there's a master public key to which you can encrypt to any identity. Identity can be any string, essentially. And you can only decrypt when you have the corresponding secret key, decryption key of that identity. And that decryption key could be computed only with the master secret key. Now, what we want to do in this feature is essentially decentralize that master secret key, put it in a threshold way, so that we can give uh, canisters and users the possibility to derive the decryption key corresponding to an identity of the canister's choice. What that would allow you to do is essentially do encrypted storage, encrypted messaging, social networks, do that all in an end-to-end -end encrypted way because we'll provide a mechanism to make sure that the decryption key corresponding to an identity will end up only on the user's device and not on, on the replicas running it. So by, by doing this, you can essentially ensure, you can write an app so that, for example, in encrypted storage, any device that can authenticate successfully under your internet identity can recover the decryption key from the internet computer without any of the replicas being able to see that decryption key. So this would be perfect for these kind of end-to-end -end encrypted storages. There's other use cases like um, minor extracted value protection, time lock encryption, dead man switch. Um, we'll be doing a dedicated community conversation uh, about this in, uh, in two weeks from now. Um, but uh, if you want to already chime in on the conversation, then uh, uh, join the forum post right there. Thanks. 
Thanks a lot, uh, Gregory, for, for, for this part. And thanks, Ruhl, for your part. So uh, I think we have a bit of time to, to discuss a few questions. So um, maybe I start uh, with a question for you, Ruhl. So yeah. um, Matthew Harmon asked, uh, do the canisters get the HTTP headers passed to them? Uh, yes, I don't think it's really relevant for the confidentiality aspect, but in general, yes. Yeah, I agree. They should should get these headers. Or, or was there anything? If there's anything more to the question, um, please elaborate in chat. Mm -hmm. So maybe another question, also by Matthew, um, on the subject of encryption. Has anything be, been said about encryption and uh, reply attacks? Replay attacks. So. Uh, you mean in this design, if if, if replay attacks uh, pose an issue? Yes, I, I, if I understand correctly, that is the question. Yes. Um, so I think, um, is I, this I think so. I I actually have a comment on it. I think it should not be an issue because the ingress messages that you know, for example, post a note, they are signed, and an ingress message would only be. Uh, processed once on the on the internet computer right? on the on the canister so therefore i think the the replay so because there is this kind of replay protection kind of built in into the cancer in my understanding reply attacks should not be an issue in in the case of the of the vault uh, of the of the encrypted nodes there Th does that make sense rule yeah I, I think it's indeed it's built into the ic right so if uh... I don't see it particularly uh, an issue in this design either way. No. Yeah. Do, yeah. Maybe since we have you uh, also as a crypto yeah. expert on the on the call, Gregory, do, do you agree with this or, or do you see uh, issues around reply attacks in this context? I didn't see any actually, to be honest. So yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, thanks. Do you have anything else, Robin, or uh, let's have a look? <laughs> Yeah, so I can, uh, also, yeah, go ahead. There's probably also some good questions for you here. I've seen them uh, come by in chat. Ah, oh, yeah, this is uh, from Saika Das, I hope I pronounced correctly, uh, who's asking if, and I think this is related to somewhere in the beginning of your slide deck, this is related to the mess, the a call being split up into different messages, if uh, this also applies in case of notify calls or notify, yeah. Yeah. But, but. Okay. So, so this is a kind of uh, if I so I I haven't really looked into notify calls too much. So uh, take this with a grain of salt. But I I think the notify calls that these are also intercanister calls you can make. I think uh, these don't have a callback. So so that would mean there there is kind of there would not be a, a set. They're kind of you know like one shot messages. You just send them out, right? And then you wouldn't uh, process a, a response for them. But uh, I mean, to be completely sure, I, I would have to look it up again. But this is my understanding. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we can we can confirm this uh, as well uh, internally. But from from the documentation and from the skull, it seems to be uh, asynchronous. Let's say so you wouldn't have this issue. Um, okay. What else is there? Uh, there are a few questions or remarks about the locking mechanism. Um, so, uh, what is this instead of a lock? The, the, the question is instead of a lock, we could also put, and, and I know, I don't know what, I think it's a typo, it, we, we, we could also put something before balance in a variable and check it after to ensure it has not been changed across the boundary. And if it has, just drop the entire transaction. I see. Okay, would that, would that work? Should we go back to the slide or? Uh, I think uh, I, I think it works without going back to the slides. It's a, it's a good question. So you're, if I understand correctly, you're essentially saying um, we could record the balance before the call and check if it's still the same after the call. And then if it's not, uh, Hmm. 
Wait, but, but isn't I'm, the problem that it, it already happened, right? Because the call is right. transferring ICP, so that already happened. So even if right. you determine it, it has happened and uh -huh. the balance changed, then you, there's no way to go back. Yeah, but so, okay, uh, we have to distinguish between the balance on the ledger and the balance that is local to the canister, right? And I think what the uh, side cut means here is, is the balance locally in the canister, right? So you would check if the local balance in the canister has changed. And if that has changed, you could actually detect like this that some other call must have must have been scheduled in between, right? Which, which makes sense. But uh, I think it could be... so. I mean, in that case, right, if you detect like, af like afterwards that the balance has changed, then you would need to revert the ledger transaction, right? So, so you would need to send the money back uh, because the ledger transaction, this intercanister call actually happened before when you executed it, right? So that's, that's one thing you would need to consider. And another thing that you need to consider is that just, just saying, right, there might be fund call right and this was the only operation on the canister that makes changes to the balances but i mean in in an actual application there would probably be other calls as well where you can modify these balances right for example paying funds into this canister to your bad and to add to your balance right and then you need to be careful if you use a mechanism like this right you could run into a situation where you know another call would change the balance as well and then maybe this detection mechanism with checking if the balance changed would actually not work because you could run into situations where a balance is reduced and then immediately, you know, um, added back by some other calls, right? And then you would not, this mechanism would be insufficient. But I mean, this is a bit constructed, right? But you need to be careful about such scenarios and kind of consider other changes to the balance as well. Yeah, but generally, I mean, yeah. the, the pattern I showed, this is not the only way to, to address such is issues, right? Uh, it's just one pattern. I think it's quite simple and easy to understand and therefore useful, but there are also other ways in general to, to achieve this kind of properties, right? Yes, yeah, so I think the remark is you try to prevent the issue. Well, here uh, it would be detecting the issue and trying to roll back, but that rollback could be very difficult because you're doing a call to another canister, which is a state you might not be able to roll back. I think that's like a general uh, discussion, right? Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've, we've reached our time and there are many, many more questions. So I suggest that we take our forum post and try to answer the, the questions over there. And of course, if there are more questions, um, you can ask them on the forum as well and we will get back to you. Is there anything uh, you, any particular question you would still like to discuss or need more clarity about? I agree. We can we can take the remaining questions to the forum. That that works well for me. All right. Good. Then yeah, we'd like to thank everyone uh, for presenting and for attending, and uh, certainly join us next time. Yeah. Also, many thanks to everyone who attended. Um, I hope this was useful. And uh, yeah. So bye, everyone. <laughs>